So is America's new stealth fighter, the next generation air dominance platform, already dead in the water? That's a question a lot of people are asking after recent statements made by Air Force Chief of Staff General David Alvin that sure made it seem as though the NGAD program's future is anything but certain. And in this era of rapidly advancing military technology, there's a pretty reasonable argument to be made that it just doesn't make sense to purchase these extremely high-end, once-a-generation fighters that are meant to fly for decades at a time. And it may be time for a significant shift in the Air Force's acquisition strategy. So let's talk about the future of the Next Generation Air Dominance Program and fighter acquisitions in general, because the times, they are a-changing. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Ground news makes it easier than ever to stay on top of what's going on in the world, while also peering right through the veil of media bias that's so common in today's news coverage. And they do that by collecting news articles published by outlets all over the globe and placing them in a single easy-to-read feed. Here's a great example and a story that's worth discussing. The head of Ukraine's Air Force, Sergei Hulupsov, recently said that Ukraine will be storing some of their F-16s in NATO nations, not operationally, but effectively to leave them there as spares to replace aircraft that they lose, either in combat operations or in attacks on the runway. Right here on Ground News, we can see that 44 news outlets have already covered this story, including seven left-leaning ones, nine right-leaning ones, and at least 16 centrist outlets. And just to the left of that, we can not only get the summary of this story from Ground News, but we can also check out some different headlines based on political affiliations, with left-leaning outlets like this one running headlines that say, Ukraine may store some F-16 warplanes in other countries to protect them from Russian attacks, versus the Russian state media-affiliated TASS news agency, which ran the headline, some of F-16s transferred to Kyiv to be deployed outside Ukraine. And you can see how both of these headlines are technically factually accurate, but the word choices are clearly meant to convey different images. In fact, you can even use the location feature to see which nations are covering a story and which ones are giving it the silent treatment. Because after all, bias isn't just about how you cover a story, but it's also about how you choose which stories you cover. Ground News is an indispensable tool for my research and a big part of my news consumption in general, and it can be for you too. In fact, I can get you a great deal. Just go to ground.news slash sandbox with two X's or follow the link in the description below to get 40% off the same vantage plan that I use every day. Again, that's ground.news slash sandbox to get 40% off their vantage plan to help you stay on top of things. The Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance Program started all the way back in 2014, when now Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall commissioned a secret study entitled The Dominance Initiative. This study was all about identifying the emerging technologies required to produce a generational leap over today's most advanced fighters, namely platforms like the F-22 and F-35. Within a year, this study's findings were rolled into a classified X-plane program that saw buy-in from the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, and DARPA, which produced at least one flying technology demonstrator by 2020 that was not only operating, but but was already setting records. Exactly what kinds of records, we still don't know. And this program has continued to mature to this very day, with previous Air Force statements indicating that the contract would be awarded to produce this new fighter this year. Now, earlier this year, Northrop Grumman backed out of the competition, leaving it seemingly up to Lockheed Martin or Boeing. And with contract awards expected to be announced, literally any day now. It came as quite a shock when Air Force Chief of Staff General David Alvin made it seem as though the NGAD contract may not be happening at all. I'll quote him directly. The deliberations are still underway, and there's been no decision made. We're looking at a lot of very difficult options that we have to consider. 
And let's be honest here, some of those options being considered are all but certain to be cost-saving measures, as the Air Force stares down the barrel of several extremely expensive modernization programs, some of which are already well over budget, and all the rest, even if on time and on budget, are still being hammered by both inflation and an uncertain political and budgetary future. After all, the Air Force isn't just on the hook to replace its endangered species air superiority fighter, the F-22 Raptor, with this new NGAD platform, but it's also got to replace aging fleets of B-2 Spirit and B-1B Lancer strategic bombers, with the forthcoming B-21 Raider, as well as America's long-serving arsenal of Minuteman III ICBMs with the new LGM-35 Sentinel. And this really complicates things. America's new stealth bomber, the B-21 Raider, has already entered low-rate initial production and by all accounts has been largely on time and on schedule thus far. But back in 2010, it was projected that the B-21 would cost some $550 million per airframe. And while the cost of production has actually come down since then, Inflation alone has brought that price tag all the way up to just below $800 million per aircraft. And with the Air Force intending to purchase at least 100 of these bombers, that is a huge difference. And then you have the Sentinel program, which has not been nearly as successful so far. The Sentinel ICBM program was projected to cost a total of $65 billion in 2015. By 2021, that had increased to $95 billion. And now, just recently, the newest estimates place it at just north of $131 billion. And with the defense budget not increasing at the same rate as these costs are, it leaves the Air Force in the unenviable position of having to choose which programs to pay for and which ones to cut. And while lawmakers are sure to hold Air Force officials accountable when programs go over budget or behind schedule, the truth is these problems are made all the worse by those lawmakers themselves. You see, at this point, it's become pretty standard fare for Congress to fail to pass the defense budget until months into the fiscal year they're supposed to be funding. And what that means is just about every year, the defense apparatus is forced into something called continual resolution spending. Now, this effectively means the DOD is operating without a functional budget for anywhere from days to weeks or often even months. And as a result, new programs and initiatives are frozen until that budget can be passed, and some ongoing initiatives are frozen as well. The U.S. Navy's new USS Gerald Ford aircraft carrier is a great example. This program has certainly gone over budget and behind schedule, but repeatedly its production has been halted or delayed by continual resolution spending as the defense apparatus waited for Congress to get its ducks in a row so they could afford to buy the resources, equipment, or hire the personnel required for the next stage of production. Sometimes this even results in laying off skilled personnel for you to just go and try to recruit them again three months later. So now you have the added cost of re-recruiting personnel you laid off three months ago, of storing half-complete projects and shipyards and hangars, of adjusting the timetables of all the subsequent programs that were supposed to use those same facilities, and maybe worst of all, while Congress spent three or four months bickering, inflation didn't take a break. So now, executing those contracts are going to cost just a little bit more than they would have four months ago when they were supposed to be funded. This nearly annual continual resolution spending problem is so severe that at this point, the defense apparatus effectively plans to do little to nothing in the first quarter of every fiscal year, recognizing the fact that they will need to execute a full year's worth of contracts in the eight or nine months that they actually get funding once Congress finally figures the budget out. And as a result, everything's just a little bit more complicated and expensive than it needs to be. Which brings us full circle all the way back around to the Next Generation Air Dominance Program, which has already been underway in one form or another for a decade, and has already seen well north of a billion dollars invested in it. But now, when we're expecting a contract award to be announced any day, the Air Force is reconsidering awarding that contract at all. 
And now there's at least some evidence to suggest that the Air Force is considering a dramatic shift in their acquisition model for fighters, one we actually discussed at some length a few years ago before Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall dismissed it as, ironically, being too expensive. Now, this model that we've previously called the Digital Century series could produce more capable aircraft more frequently, but at this stage in the NGAD program's development would almost certainly dictate design changes for the aircraft designs that are currently competing for this contract, potentially extending timelines and likely even increasing cost up front but in the long term may actually shake out for the better, depending on how it's executed. Now, we call this acquisition model the Digital Century series first because it relies heavily on digital fighter designs that can be tested extensively in an all-digital environment, and second for its similarity to the acquisition process used for the original Century series of fighters, which were a string of six different interceptor and fighter-bomber designs fielded in rapid succession by the U.S. Air Force in the 1950s and 60s. All six of these fighters were fielded over over the span of just a decade or so, thanks in large part to shared high-performance and avionics systems. And that is very much what the Digital Century series aims to get back to. Rather than fielding a new fighter design that the U.S. intends to operate for 50, 60, even 70 years, as they have with platforms like the F-15 and F-35, the Digital Century series would aim to field an entirely new fighter design every five to ten years. And that approach comes with some big industry upsides, starting with cutting off the most expensive portion of any fighter program's budget, long-term sustainment. And the F-35 is a great example. Its $1.7 trillion program cost was recently bumped up to $2 trillion, and lots of people are happy to bandy that number about, but most outlets fail to mention that that $2 trillion figure includes the cost of operating a few thousand of these fighters for 60 years, which is how long the F-35 is meant to stay in service. By instead fielding an aircraft that only needs to operate for, say, 10 to 15 years, you dramatically cut down those costs, while also fielding new fighter designs at frequent intervals, allowing you to incorporate new technology that may not have been available in the last 10-year interval. And maybe most importantly, it would also kickstart the fighter industry in the U.S. again. These days, there are really only three American companies left in the fighter business, all of which pay their bills through a long list of other military and commercial endeavors, because fighter contracts tend to be awarded once every couple of decades at best. And with Lockheed Martin winning 1991's Advanced Tactical Fighter Competition to field the F-22 Raptor, and then also winning 2001's Joint Strike Fighter Competition to field the F-35, that means it's been nearly a half century since the U.S. fielded a clean sheet fighter design that didn't come from the halls of Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works. And that makes it pretty tough to have an actually competitive industrial base. But by fielding new fighters every five or ten years, and importantly, by separating the design and production contracts, you could open the door to a whole new slew of smaller aerospace design firms who could step in with cutting-edge designs that leverage the most advanced technologies available, while still turning to those established prime contractors, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Boeing, for the production contracts once a design has been purchased. And if it sounds crazy to have one of these prime contractors work on a fighter they didn't design, you should know they already do. Northrop Grumman, for instance, produces a great deal of the center fuselage of the F-35. Now, Roper's Digital Century series acquisition model aimed to curtail all those costs and provide all those benefits through agile software development and by leaning into digital engineering, effectively designing and testing these aircraft almost entirely in the digital environment, but importantly, also by leveraging open system modular architecture. And that basically means taking the technology you always have to shove into the fuselage of a new aircraft and turning them into modular systems that can not only be easily replaced for upgrades, but can similarly be easily swapped into the next new fighter design as it manifests, meaning you don't start from scratch 
scratch with every new fight or design. You start with the changes you want to make from the last one, and any systems that aren't being upgraded can simply be carried over. This dramatically reduces the cost of developing new fighters, especially when doing it in such rapid succession, allowing you to effectively just upgrade what needs to be upgraded while leaving the rest just as it is. And while the Air Force hasn't plainly stated that this is the model they intend to pursue, some statements from General David Alvin last week sure made it sound that way. I'll quote him again. Built to last is a tremendous 20th century bumper sticker. And the assumption then was whatever you had was relevant as long as it lasts. I'm not sure that's true anymore. But of course, we're already some 10 years and north of a billion dollars into the development of this new next generation air dominance fighter, with the competing designs meant to operate for a half century or more rather than just a decade or so. And that would require some pretty significant changes to the competing designs if they were to fit into this new digital century series model. And that makes me wonder. You see, back in 2022, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall dismissed this Digital Century Series concept for NGAD, saying that at this point it would be far too expensive to transition toward. So two years further into development, it certainly didn't get cheaper. What gives? Well, I think it's at least possible that what we're actually seeing here is a bit of a negotiating tactic. The U.S. Air Force may indeed intend to transition toward this Digital Century Series acquisition model for future fighter purchases. I just think it's more likely the transition would take place after NGAD. After all, the U.S. military is a massive enterprise with a great deal of cultural inertia to overcome. And when you include prime contractors and in industry alongside it, there's even more cultural inertia to beat back. And as a result, it takes a long time to implement a change like this. So we may just be seeing the political groundwork being laid for this eventual transition, and it may be being discussed in relation to NGAD to apply some added pressure to both Lockheed Martin and Boeing when it comes to contract negotiations. After all, the U.S. Air Force themselves have acknowledged that they did a pretty poor job managing the contract execution for the F-35 program, a problem that still haunts them to this day. And they are very likely negotiating aggressively to make sure that they don't run into similar problems with this new stealth fighter. And one of the reasons I think that's at least possible is the timetable the Air Force is working with. You see, the NGAD program began in the first place because the F-22 Raptor, America's reigning air superiority champ, is already living on borrowed time. As we've discussed lots of times in the past, the F-22 program was canceled early after just 186 fighters were delivered out of an initial 750 fighter order. And worse, only 150 or so of those fighters were actually combat coded or carried all the requisite systems on board needed to fly combat operations. And that means there are only 150 F-22 Raptors out there that can fight and there will never be any more. So if Raptors are lost to damage or destroyed in combat, you simply can't replace them. And maybe even more importantly, if they age out of service, you can't replace them either. The F-22 was designed for a 6,000 flight hour lifespan. And as these aircraft reach that mark, the Air Force will be facing some tough decisions. They can either invest heavily into a lifespan extension program for just 100 or maybe 150 jets, or they can have a new platform waiting in the wings to replace it. And to be honest, having a new platform makes a lot more sense. After all, even if you do invest in a service life extension program for the Raptor, you'll still have to replace it once that extension runs out. And if the Air Force doesn't time this quite right, there's a very real possibility that America's high-end air superiority role could be gapped for some time, as F-22s age out of service and whatever will come to replace them has yet to manifest. And that is a huge risk to take as nations like China are ramping up production of their own fifth-generation fighters. 
So if I were a betting man, I would put my money on NGAD continuing as we've envisioned it in the past, potentially with some contract revisions meant to shorten its lifespan and curtail its long-term sustainment costs. But there is a real possibility that we see NGAD delayed and manifest as something a bit different than it was originally meant to be. And to be clear, that could also work out, but there's a lot more risk along that road. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.